Hello, everybody. It's Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is uh, Tuesday, August the 10th, 2021. Today's topic is Andrew Jackson versus Barack Obama. But before we get into that, I want to urge you to go ahead and click on the subscribe button in the lower right. So you'll be subscribed to my uh, channel and also the notification bell in the upper right. So you'll be notified when new episodes get released. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and begin with my discussion of Andrew Jackson versus Barack Obama. Based upon Obama's lavish birthday party this past weekend, Americans of President Jackson's era would have recognized his guiding principles as the opposite of those of Barack Obama. Not because Jackson was a white slaveholder and Obama is half black, but because Jackson felt the society's elites should be held to the same rules as ordinary Americans. They would be appalled at the media and ruling political party that ignores the hypocrisy of Obama's defiance of COVID guidelines really basically promulgated by the Democrat Party and doing so by hosting a crowd of hundreds of elites who were not wearing masks. Jackson was the first commoner elected president after a string of six aristocrats. His 1829 inauguration was unprecedented. 10,000 people, mostly commoners, attended. According to eyewitness Margaret Bayard Smith, the crowd was composed of, quote, countrymen, farmers, gentlemen, women and children, black and white, close quote. The White House was open to all, including the blacks. 17 years earlier, his victory against an invading British army at New Orleans demonstrated to European powers that our young republic could defend itself. The American Revolution, therefore, was unlikely to be transitory like the French one. The USA would not return to be being a European colony, while France would return to being a monarchy. Moreover, Jackson used free blacks as soldiers at New Orleans. He insisted that such soldiers, whom he called, quote, the sons of freedom, close quote, be paid the same as whites. President Jackson did not believe that elites were superior to commoners, but just better at staying in power. He anticipated the dangers of a deep state composed of perpetual office holders. He proposed term limits for elected officials and replaced about 15% of the bureaucrats who had been appointed by earlier administrations. He felt that, quote, rotation of office, close quote, rather than permanent tenure should be the principle uh, in a democracy. There are, <clears throat> there are, he said, few men who can for any great length of time enjoy office and power without being under the influence of feelings unfavorable to the faithful discharge of their public duties. They are apt to acquire a habit of looking with indifference upon the public interests. Although detractors criticized Jackson's rotation of office as a, quote, spoils system, close quote, Heritage Foundation journalist Jarrett Stepman defends him. That so-called spoiled system had market advantages over the modern one in which virtually none of today's Three million government employees can lose their job for any reason. And the disadvantages of the so called spoils system pale in comparison to the deep state. Andrew Jackson would have been horrified at the total lack of democratic accountability over today's bureaucrats. And so also should we. Jackson also opposed the symbiotic relationship between big government and big business, termed crony capitalism. Consider 
the present alliance between President Joe Biden's Democrat Party and the consumer facing big tech companies such as Google, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon. Employees of all five overwhelmingly make their political donations to the Democrat Party. The alliance is so obvious that White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki shamelessly urged publicly that the big tech, big tech companies even collude together in order to silence voices that differ from the White House COVID policies. Such audacious public action suggests that the White House might also be privately urging big tech to censor voices contrary to other Democrat party objectives in areas such as free speech, gun rights, voter integrity, government subsidies, and spending earmarks. One way Jackson demonstrated his opposition to crony capitalism was to veto a bill that would have extended the charter of the Second Bank of the United States, a privately owned central bank. He concluded that its monopoly had become too powerful and unaccountable. In truth, many politicians were on its payroll. Consequently, Jackson's veto message stated, quote, it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of the government to their selfish purpose. When the laws undertake to add artificial advantages, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, they have a right to complain. Jackson also vetoed state level infrastructure projects. Like most Southerners, he believes that such quote, internal improvements, close quotes, were more properly the responsibility of the individual states. During his presidency, many such projects were in today's Midwestern states where they had originally undertaken them at their own expense. When the projects proved to be uneconomical, however, the Midwestern states sought federal bailouts. And that's one reason why a quarter of a century later, the Confederate Constitution outlawed such spending by the central government. It would have to be up to the states individually. Lastly, Jackson was the only president to pay off the federal debt, which he described as a curse. His fiscal prudence may be one reason that American that America has survived to, to date. A selfish leader of such a young republic might readily have corrupted her clean balance sheet with fraudulent and extravagant loans, as did the carpetbag regimes for the individual states in the South during the Reconstruction era. Notwithstanding that Jackson paved the way for commoners to become president, the Obama administration proposed to replace his, his image with that of Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. It hasn't happened yet, but President Biden wants it to. And given Obama's ostentatious and hypocritical defiance of COVID restrictions for his family and his elite friends at his birthday party, unprivileged Americans of today might prefer to keep Jackson on the $20 bill because he represented their interest with no favors to the elites as Obama takes for himself and his friends. Lastly, Obama's birthday party makes three other implications, suggests three other implications. First, Obama would not have spent $12 million on waterfront property at Martha's Vineyard if he really believed in global warming. Second, he would not have proceeded with an extravagant birthday party if he really believed in the Democrat Party's COVID guidelines. And third, any man who holds a 60th birthday party at all lavish for himself might be insufferably vain. The, um, you want to learn more about 
Jackson and what the politics were like before the Civil War that caused the Civil War, then buy the, my book, Causes of the Civil War by Philip Lee, L-E-I-G-H. You can get it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and other fine bookstores for $22. Just go there and hunt it down. Causes of the Civil War by Philip Lee. But if you want an autographed copy, you can get it from me. Start off by emailing me. Phil, P-H-I-L underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H at me, M-E dot com. And once you order it, I'll ship it to you here in the United States for $25. I cover the shipping. You'll have an autographed copy. Okay, well, that is our show for today. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll be back later this week with more. Goodbye.